Thorofan presents The Great Lasix Debate. Hey again, everybody. This is Doc with Thorofan, and welcome to part two of the Great Lasix Debate. In part one, we focus on just the facts of exactly what EIPH is, as well as exactly what Lasix is and how it works. Now we're moving on a little bit more into the meat of the subject, and we're going to take a look at kind of exactly what they feel some of the theories are for why EIPH occurs, as well as exactly how various grades of EIPH may affect performance based on some of the studies that are out there. Again, remember, we're looking just at the facts and the science that's out there. We're not offering an opinion one way or the other. That's for you to do. And then finally, we're going to look at exactly how Lasix works to reduce the incidence and severity of EIPH in these horses. So as you may be able to hear in the background, they are howling ready for us to get on with this as we continue with the Great Lasix Debate! Before we dive into the causes of EIPH, it is interesting to note that it is not an issue that is unique only to horses. Racing greyhounds, elite athletes, and, oddly enough, saxophone players playing prolonged music have all been shown to suffer some alveolar bleeding. We will leave the debate of if Lasix should be given to saxophone players pre-performance for another day. Okay. So we know what EIPH is, so what can be some causes, and what effects can it have on the horse itself? No one has been able to pin down the exact reason some horses suffer EIPH and some don't. Many theories have been proposed as to why it happens. As we talked about in the opening segment, there are extreme pressure differentials in the area of the lung called the alveoli, leading to the very thin wall between the airspace and the capillaries to rupture and then bleed. Anything that can cause a further change in the pressure or cause potential weakening to that wall can be found to increase the risk of bleeding. So, if a horse has some allergic lung disease or bronchitis, it can predispose them to bleeding more. If they have a problem in the larynx, such as displacing their palate or being a roarer, as we say, when racing, that can predispose them as well. There is also a lot of research going into if this is more of a trauma-type injury, where the mere action of the horse when in full stride causes the lungs to be kind of punched by a shockwave from their front leg hitting the ground. Whatever the reason, it is something that no one wants to see and everyone tries to find ways to avoid. Any disruption of air exchange in the lungs will lead to a decrease in performance, and a more severe case of bleeding will potentially cause a horse to just stop running altogether. Just take a look at Sarah Gary Empress in the Fairground Oaks as a recent example. Usually, a one-time bleeding episode is not the concern, but rather the cumulative effect of multiple bleeding episodes. There is evidence now through some research that the repeating bleeding episodes leads to what we call a remodeling effect of the veins that take blood from the capillaries and back to the heart. These veins actually start to thicken in response to the inflammation caused by repeat bleeding episodes. As they thicken, the lumen, or open space that the blood can travel through, narrows. All this means is it's harder for blood to leave the capillaries, causing it to back up a bit and can lead to, you guessed it, more bleeding from the back pressure on the capillary walls. Multiple bleeding episodes can also lead to things such as pneumonia and a lot of inflammation in those areas of the lung that, if prolonged and severe enough, can kind of scar those areas of the lung, making it not able to exchange oxygen very well for a long time or permanently. For example, you can see in this image that a set of lungs that have undergone multiple episodes of EIPH have evidence of discoloration similar to bruising compared to the healthy lungs on the left. So, what does this all mean when it comes to actual performance on the racetrack? From what I could find, there are not a lot of really well carried out studies of U.S. horses running at U.S. tracks under U.S. training and housing conditions to look at the true effect on performance. The main studies that have been done on a larger scale have been completed in both South Africa and Australia, and even they don't completely agree. The South African studies showed that there was a correlation between any grade of EIPH and performance, while the recent Australian studies said only really severe EIPH had a statistically significant effect. Is this because of different quality of horses, different climate, different genetics? There may never be a true answer. These areas were also likely looked at more because they do not allow race day use of Lasix. 
so it gave a true representative sample of horses racing off the medication. A recent study just completed in out of Hong Kong, where they also do not allow race day Lasix, seems to back up the Australian studies in showing that horses that did have EIPH seem to race just as frequently and basically just as well as their counterparts that did not have EIPH. What has been mostly agreed upon across the globe is that if EIPH does affect performance to a greater degree, it's likely going to be happening in the later stages of a race, when endurance and the ability to really maximally use oxygen in the lung to nourish tiring muscles is most crucial. Even this is debated, though, as there are other factors, such as how fast the horse goes early and what the race dynamics are, that could cause them to tire more, irrespective of if they bled or not. It just goes to show that this is not a simple issue with a simple answer. Another area currently being looked at is how EIPH affects horses long-term throughout their lives and long after their racing careers are over. While no true data that I could find exists on this point, many that take in retired thoroughbreds have not found severely debilitating issues secondary to EIPH, preventing these horses from going on to do such things as show jumping, dressage, or even pleasure riding. In the first segment, we talked about exactly what furosemide, or Lasix, is and how it works. The diuretic effect of Lasix causes the liquid volume of blood to decrease. Basically stated, decreased fluid means decreased pressure. With decreased pressure on the capillary side of the alveolar wall in the lung, there is less likelihood of bleeding to occur. There is also some thinking that Lasix somehow causes blood to be a little redistributed away from those back areas of the lung that are most prone to bleeding, again decreasing the pressures and thus bleeding. It really pretty much is that simple. Create a situation with less fluid, and you get a situation of less pressure, with all else being equal. Now, that is not to say that this is the only effect Lasix has on the body, and we will be discussing this and why folks feel it is not as benign as it seems in the next segment. For the purposes of this segment, though, we are merely looking at exactly why Lasix works in reducing the incidence and severity of EIPH. And based on all the studies done out there, there is no doubt in the veterinary world that it does. There you go. Everything that you possibly wanted to know, and still some of the stuff that we still don't know, in regards to exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage and its effect on racehorses both long-term and in their performance in races. Uh, whether you believe it truly has an effect or not kind of depends on uh, what study you may have read, what research you believe, and maybe your own personal experience. We also now know exactly why Lasix is used to prevent EIPH, as well as, you know, kind of the mechanisms behind it and why it works so well. That's the end of uh, stage two of the Great Lasix debate. When we move on to segment or stage three, this is the part I think that everybody's really going to be interested in. That is where we really look at the two diametrically opposed camps and we see exactly why some people feel that Lasix is absolutely needed for the welfare of the horse, and those that feel that actually Lasix does more harm than good due to some of the side effects long term and where it may be linked to other conditions and we'll take a look at the science and see if there's any uh, justification for those findings. That is going to be coming to you next week. I am Dr. Thorofan and we will see you then as we continue the Great LASIKS DEBATE! <laughs>